life. Don't talk to me about life. It's Tal Day, 2014, and this is a special episode of The Wow Signal. It consists almost entirely of a panel discussion about the ideas and best jokes of the late, lamented Douglas Noel Adams, the author of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, a couple of Dirk Gently books, and a few other things. So, make sure you know where your towel is, pour a pint or three of your favorite muscle relaxant, grab a couple of bags of peanuts, and listen very, very closely. I'd like to welcome everybody. We, we're here to talk about the work of Douglas Adams, and in particular how his work has interested, inspired, or stimulated your own thoughts in some way. We'll go around, and so we'll just go around to a brief inter- set of introductions, and then so we have Nicholas Joel. Hello, pleased to be here. Now I have from your from your website, you're a philosopher and author, and uh, you are a person primarily responsible for a book called Philosophy and the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So I thought you'd be the perfect first guest to have have on. I've been I've been reading that book lately. It's really it's funny and and full of lots of interesting ideas. I didn't know so many people had thought through these things. <laughs> now I do. The, ch- the chapter on the, uh, what's his name? Uh, the chapter six has really got my attention. Uh, on the, uh, Is that Barry Dayton? Yeah, one? yeah. Yeah. From Deep Thought to Digital Metaphysics, the chapter's called. Yeah. I, I'd actually wrote a blog post on that a couple of years ago about how Adams may have been right, and he may have actually not thought big enough. Perhaps the whole universe was, was uh, meant to compute something. And, uh, right. <laughs> but, and, and it turns out that, uh, I wasn't the first to think of that, of course. Uh, so Nicholas, what, uh, is there anything else you'd like to tell us about yourself? Uh, um, no, no, no. You've mentioned the book that, um, I'm very proud of and, uh, that's enough to be going on. See, Jeremy Hunsberger, are you still there? Uh, yes. Tell us about yourself a little bit, Jeremy. Currently a college student, uh, for game programming, although I'm a bit of an aspiring comedy writer as well. I'm a huge Douglas Adams fan uh, ever since my uh, dad got me into the Hitchhiker's Guide when I was uh, younger. Uh, my mom got me into it. Now, now I, I was a college student when it came out. But you're, <laughs> so, so, there's a bit of a generation gap here. I remember going to the college bookstore looking and seeing this rather odd science fiction book and thinking, I don't know if I like humor in my science fiction. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, then the radio show came out. Uh, available in the U.S. a few months later, and I was hooked. Ben Brockert, you there? Uh, yep. Ben, do you know where your towel is? <laughs> I do. Yes, thank you. And and what else about about you that we should know? <laughs> uh, so I'm an aerospace engineer, uh, actually trying to get into space so that I can get thrown out of an airlock. But uh, uh, Adam, since I was uh, a teenager before, did uh, maintain the alt. Dot fan dot Douglas Adams massive frequently asked questions list for a few years doing the web hosting and stuff on that and uh, really got into all the really obscure bits of Douglas Adams stuff like uh, how many different versions of the Hitchhiker's Guide that there have been so far which is far more than most people realize and things like the uh, um, uh, Marvin the Paranoid Android uh, double B side where there's actually songs. <laughs> Original songs written from the perspective of, of Marvin the Paranoid Android. So um, it's uh, he's definitely my favorite author, and uh, and uh, I wish he was still writing uh, yeah. slowly and missing deadlines. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, uh, Mike Mongo, ladies and gentlemen, Mike Mongo. <laughs> I, and I think I'm the actually I think I'm the the funniest guy here. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm, oh. I'm, a, I'm a, is that a is, is that's an open dare? I'm an astronaut teacher. I get to I get to stand in front of a rooms full of people and 
and introduced myself as Mike Mongo, astronaut teacher. My glasses are upside down. I work with students, young students, all over, all over, and encourage kids to pursue careers in astronautics and space. And you have to have a good, good sense of humor to get get that that sort of acclaim. Uh, Mike, when did you first run into Douglas Adams? Oh, now here's a funny thing about uh, I was. Uh, I was. I used to play. I used to be really into a game called Galaga. Everybody knows Galaga. And there is a video game room. They used to have places where people would go and and uh, smoke cigarettes and, and play video games together. You put quarters and machines, and and then you just spent your two two to five minutes, depending on how good you are at it. And the person who was running the video game room was this hippie Scientologist. <laughs> Who gave me a, a a coverless copy of Hitchhiker's Guide? The, all the pages have been ripped apart, so they're each individual pages, and it was bound with a rubber band. And how how could I not read that? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, I just was astounded. That was in high school. I was I, I think that was around eighty three. Uh, Jim Jim Cavera, you there? Okay, Jim's not on yet. Um, and He's course, just soft-spoken. Yes. And, of course, there's me. Uh, I'm Paul Carr, as you probably know, blogger, podcaster, aerospace engineer, and uh, a Douglas Adams fan since about 1979. Um, actually, I I actually, uh, I didn't realize it was him, but I was watching Doctor Who on PBS, and he, and the, and I thought, well, these scripts are unusually witty and funny for Doctor Who. <laughs> Turned out that was the ones he had edited. I'd like, I'd like to uh, sort of kick out some questions to you and see if you guys want have anything to say about these uh, these topics. Uh, the first one, and one, and I'm, I'll just start with the thing that the idea that most interests me in all of Hitchhiker's Guide was the mice and the Earth and Swarty Bartfast and how the notion that the Earth exists in order to compute something, and then maybe all of reality is is computational in nature. That that's you know yet another removal of humanity from the center of things, and I think that that was kind of Adam's intention there was to, in a humorous way, make us feel even less significant that we're you know we're cogs in this great Earth computer. Any of you find that particularly striking or interesting? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> your turn, Mike. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Paul, you're going to be the straight man this whole this whole episode. I'm trying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a an interesting uh, sort of alternative to that idea, which is that, uh, in fact, like all humans are essentially here for the purpose of furthering technology. That uh, you know that that the Earth is sort of a big processing machine, but the output is is to send machines out into the cosmos. That essentially we are uh, we're driven to create technology and send it out. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, you can definitely make argument sometimes seem like, you know, we are compelled to do things that don't entirely make sense. Yeah. And, and we, we love tinkering with things and breaking things and building things for no purpose in particular. <laughs> can I ask something about that, Ben? Yeah. Um, it, that idea could come in, um, a, a weaker and a stronger version. I think they, um, stronger in the sense of claiming more, the stronger version would be that um, there is some being or some beings with, with a purpose, and that purpose is to further technology, and we have been created by those beings to do that. And the weaker version of the idea, I suppose, would be that we haven't actually been created by some being to do that, but nonetheless, you can interpret human life in some way as if that is our purpose. Or perhaps um, we could say that it's something like our trajectory as it's happened to develop that um, we are furthering technology. So uh, what is the idea exactly? Uh, I think it's usually presented more in the, in the weaker sense, just that, you know, as humans have evolved, uh, we've also created technology and machines and stuff that is also evolving and that now uh, in some ways we're subservient to that uh, that sort of machine evolution in that they can last longer in theory than we can and that we're now doing things like there's the the, the rep rap project that i'm sure douglas adams would have been a huge fan of in which uh the, the the general objective is to create machines that can then create copies of themselves 
the, the term in general is called a clanking replicator where, where you have a machine that can, that can output itself basically. So, so the, the natural, like the, the full on evolution of would be having a whole system full of machines that are making more of themselves. And we're either, you know, have all blown ourselves up or, or who knows what, but that, uh, you know, because they can, they're, you know, less susceptible to radiation and can essentially, you know, hibernate forever, could be sent from star to star at the speeds that we can do without an infinite improbability drive that, uh, that it, you know, it's possible that machines can, in the end, do much more than we ever could. Yeah. Hmm. And, and if, you, if you look at things like pyramids and moon landings, it doesn't, you know, there doesn't seem to be any real practical use for those things. They just... Do we just seem to be driven to do them? You could even argue there's not really even a, a kind of Darwinian selection advantage to it. We, we just do these crazy things. Well, but I'm sure a lot of people got laid for putting people on the moon, so it works out. <laughs> <laughs> I joined, I'm the generation of aerospace engineers after that, and I can tell you, it, <laughs> mm-hmm. bad effect is gone. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> Roger. Uh, um, but, but Paul, um, if, if, the, if the idea of that we are on a, a um, putting people on the moon does in some way serve the project of um, continuing human life in machine form, right? I mean, that, that would be the way that that idea fits into what Ben just said. Yes. Uh, and so the sort of post humanism range of, yeah. range of concepts. It's part of our technological ascent, you could say. Yeah. Yeah. That wouldn't be very funny. So he de- he never <laughs> never really went down that path. <laughs> the question is not is it true. The question is is it funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, well, the, key, that, see, okay, key, the key in the end is to make sure that the machines don't have the personality of you know the doors on the heart of gold, where you know they're all happy. They're all uh, happy Marvin, that, that brings up Marvin, right? I mean, yeah, or Marvin, depressed. <laughs> Marvin was a very unhappy, very advanced robot with a brain the size of a planet, and he hadn't replaced humans yet. I'm sure he wanted to. Oh, I, I no, what would be the point? <laughs> I don't know if you guys have heard the sort of alternative fan theory that Marvin having the size of the brain, uh, a brain the size of a planet, that in fact Marvin's brain is Earth. That that was why Marvin was depressed was because Earth wasn't working correctly. <laughs> hey, that's um, okay. I have not heard that one before. I've always just assumed it. that was a, that was a metaphor for being much smarter than you than you humans, but. <laughs> Yeah, it, if you if you, you reread the books with that uh, with that perspective, it uh, some of it can kind of make sense because you know the whole thing with the, uh, the you know the, the aliens coming and screwing up and killing off the cavemen, which you know it would end up with Earth not working correctly, and so in the end Marvin's brain wasn't working correctly, and so he was always wandering around depressed, and you know you you would at that point kind of wonder how much computational capacity the Earth would have for for Marvin to be wandering around in space and time, parking cars. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, well Marvin, I, I've always been fascinated with Marvin, but I never could figure him out. I, I, I thought maybe that was just a way of making fun of the whole robot meme in science fiction. Uh, you know, the, the robots that are usually far too cheerful or far too dangerous <laughs> in science fiction. And Marvin's neither dangerous nor cheerful. He doesn't want well, to kill us, and he doesn't. Li- he doesn't love us. He, he is. Me- he is menacingly depressed. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it, there. There is a there is a menacing quality to to the to the depth of his depression. Yeah, and, and that yeah, you know, that has a that has a, a great ring to it. That it's one of the one of the. I mean, like it's funny what what Nick just said a second ago about it's it's not true. It's it's, it's not true. It's funny. Something to that effect. One <laughs> of the I have I have these core philosophical values, and and one of them I I definitely lifted off of hitchhiker's guide and this is actually this is this is the case i mean these are these are actually these are who i am one is that everything always works out but the one that i got from hitchhiker's guide is that the truth makes me laugh <laughs> and, and i've been in so i can't tell you that the number of situations i've been in where the, our fellow hairless apes can be less than kind to one, our each other on a regular basis on a day in day out basis and if unless you have that that gauge right there handy that that uh let you know either this is this is the fact or this is bs is it making me laugh then uh people can really get you down and inversely some of the most some of the stupidest moments that lift the spirit of the kids through the night dun, yeah. dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to say something about that, but perhaps first we should say hello to Jim, who has um, appeared on my screen. Oh, yeah, Jim. Yes, hello. I'm here. 
Uh, hey. How about giving us a belated introduction to yourself? Uh, I'm Jim Cavera. I'm a, I don't know, physicist, writer, sometimes artist, um, all around cool guy. There we go. <laughs> Jim, everybody had to tell a joke. So the, the, everybody had to tell, tell a joke when they introduced themselves. Did you, so did you have your joke ready? Oh, I do not have a joke ready. I think that was a joke. You can just make one up. You can just make one up. I think I'm going to have to take a pass on that one. You Unless you want me joke. Googling jokes right now, which I'm not, I'm not going to see. Well, you have that to hurry one. up. The world's about to end. <laughs> <laughs> How about a riddle? <laughs> Are there any riddles in Hitchhikers? I can't remember. There aren't many. No. I don't think that, I don't remember any actually. No. What did the sea say to the shore? <laughs> Nothing. It just waved. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, you're spending too much time around kids, Mike. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you guys. <laughs> There's a character in Hitchhikers who's childlike and a lot of fun. Um, well, probably a lot of them are childlike, come to think of it. But uh, I'm thinking of Wonka the Sane. He might be my favorite character. Oh, yeah, Wonka the Sane. From um, So Long and Thanks for All the Fish, I think. I always, I always yes. thought that's John Cleese. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think. I see John Cleese with the long hair and a beard coming out of the or outside the asylum <laughs> and being, yeah, Wonka's great. Uh, this makes me think of a question for Jeremy, actually. Um, Adams's humor is this wonderful blend or, um, I think, um, of the, uh, uh, the thoughtful and, and indeed the philosophical, there's so much philosophy in Hitchhikers, um, and the funny. And I was thinking that if one's inspired by Adams to write comedy, then, um, presumably one's inspired to try and do something like that, but it must be very difficult. I would say. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, he's, he's got a very difficult style to copy because on its surface, it kind of seems like the whole, like, you know, wild and wacky and just kind of like, Ooh. Oh, like random things popping up and things to that nature. And so it's easy to, to try and copy him, but to like actually get, you know, his style of wit, it uh, crosses uh, something yeah, it's, different altogether. I, it's it's not just Monty Python; it's Kurt Vonnegut at the same time. That's that's what makes it difficult. Oh mm. uh, yeah, it's Kurt Vonnegut plus Monty Python. Yeah, <laughs> Vonnegut for the for the satire. Yeah, yeah. right, right. Yeah, there's I, I a, there's, there's a good bit of Cat's Cradle in there as well. You know, if you're familiar with Vonnegut. Yeah, I've read that one. I'm trying to remember it. Well, that's sort of like laughing at the condition, you know. It, Vonnegut's like, like if you go all the way back, as far as Timequake in in the Vonnegut catalog, where he really has gotten through all the through in his life, and he's just he's got to boil down to the essence of his understanding, which is you know it, it has to do with a joke. There's no question that mm-hmm. he, get, he gets he gets the joke. Vonnegut is getting the joke, and that's what we like about that author. With with the uh, with. With Douglas Adams, I don't think I, when people Im, Im, imitate the style, what about Terry Pratchett? Do you, do you guys feel like a, there's a connection between those, between Adams and Pratchett? Yeah. People always, when you say that you like Douglas Adams, recommend Terry Pratchett. And I, I took it seriously enough to read about a dozen of his books. And there, you know, it is kind of similar in that it's, you know, somewhat humorous science fiction, but I, I, I never really, you know, it would not click. put them on the same level. Yeah, I didn't. I but, get. Uh, I no. I like it. It see for me, Douglas Adams, where he succeeds as an author, is I, I can hear his voice. And when we're talking, uh, who who's the comedy writer? What what's? Uh, Jeremy. 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 When Jeremy was saying about <laughs> about, uh, about doing that style, about uh, uh, people people uh, trying to reach the Adams style, I have find found that. When you, you want to, want to communicate in an Adams manner, the, the best way to do it is just to embody it and, you know, channel. You can channel the spirit of Douglas Adams. You just accept him in and allow him to communicate through you in, uh, in, in, in true, uh, Ad- Adamsian fashion. It's, it's the only way to. How does one do that? I've, um, uh, done something. I haven't really imitated Adams. I've made my book funny just by copying all his jokes. But if you're not going to actually copy it, um, and you're not going to do something that's like it, because you seem to want something in between that, right? Not just like, bit like it, not copying it. 
Yeah. How does one uh, let Adams into his life, channel Douglas Adams? Well, now that he's dead, he's just a disembodied spirit. So, you know, you can just <laughs> suck him into your, you know, you display, dislodge your own soul for a second and make a little space and then have him come in there and give him control over your, uh, your pen or whatever. And, uh, and, uh, also drugs help. And, <laughs> and uh, so I, I wouldn't advocate that for, for young people. Just, I think we're, we're probably saying more about du- ourselves than we are about Douglas Adams. The, yeah, I mean, to a certain extent, he just came up in the right time and the right, the right point in our culture where we needed that kind of absurdist look at things. And but he's just brilliant. I mean, look at one guy the same. That that is just a brilliant philosophical joke. The idea of a man who decides that the world is mad, having discovered instructions on a pack of toothpicks. I had a similar moment when I discovered um, I got a bag of bananas in a plastic. Um, in cellophane wrapping, and on the wrapping it had instructions for opening the bananas back <laughs> from top. And so Wonko created an asylum into which he put the whole world, and he did this by building a house inside out. Yeah. <laughs> and labeling the, in- the, the space within the walls of the house, the outside of the asylum. It's just brilliant. Yeah, it is. Oh, I live in Key West, and, and uh, we have a sign at the, uh, at, the, at the head of the island where you're leaving the island. The island's two miles by four miles, and the entire United States is above us. And it, it says it, it says you are now, it, when you are entering Key West, there's a sign out there, that and someone's obviously inspired. But when you're entering Key West, it says you are now leaving the asylum. And when you're exiting Key West, it says you are now entering the asylum. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that, I mean, that, and there's, every time I see that, I think, I think of Douglas Adams. And, and, it, and as a matter of fact, Excellent. I mean, are, are there any, are there any parts of the Adams narrative that any of us reflect on all the time? Because I do, like the, the part about the sandwich making. Mm-hmm. I, I think that was in the second book. Yes. When, uh. No, I think it's the last book. Lam- it's it? on Lamuela, mostly oh, homeless. Really? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Okay, that, yes, you would know better than I. You're the, you're actually the scholar of the episode. <laughs> um, I've got more anal about hitchhikers. Well, I don't know. I probably haven't got more anal about hitchhikers than most people, actually. No. <laughs> in some ways. <laughs> in fact, you should be wearing some sort of special hat. I'm wearing a special t-shirt, actually. <laughs> So, uh, when, when that, in that part where it talks about the making of the sandwiches, about how he just, he, he, he made a, what, what, some sort of beast. It was a perfectly other, ordinary beast. A per- perfectly ordinary beast, beast. Uh-huh. And he didn't have anything else to do. So he just gave himself up into making sandwiches and he just became a great sandwich maker. Now, when I'm talking with kids, I'm, I, I always, I relate that story regularly just because you can dedicate yourself something to, to doing something and become very good at it. And you just carry that skill with you through life. And I pull that out of that, out of the narrative and, and use that as an example on a, on a pretty regular basis. I mean, I, I, I allude to a, a, any number of aspects of the Adams tradition, very, very specific incidents and particulars. I mean, on a day in, day out basis. When people mm-hmm. talk about how has Adams, how has the Douglas, the writings of Douglas Adams influenced your life? I, I mean, I don't know that I would be who I am without this, this, ne- this, this literature. Yeah. Somewhat similarly, I've discovered from um, Alexander Polak, um, who is a science journalist um, who knows an awful lot about Douglas Adams and what's interviewed him, and I co-wrote a chapter in the book with him. I um, learned from Alex that you can, one can treat hitchhikers uh, rather like the Bible in that if you want to illustrate just about any point, you can find a quotation somewhere in the, in the Adams corpus. Yeah. I'm going back through the Adams work uh, on Kindle now and, and highlighting lots of things. Uh, uh, probably uh, for me, uh, one of the things that sticks with me and stuck with me is, is the, the, probably the most famous joke in the whole series, which is 42. The reason for that, I, the reason he picked 42 is just the most mundane, uninteresting thing you could think of. But then you back up to that. What is the question? And for me, it's always been about the questions and not the answers. And I, I, I've i developed a strong distrust of final answers, whether they're 42 or whatever, and a, a great respect for people who keep asking the questions and don't ha- don't prompt offer final answers. And uh, the I'm, I'm sorry, Nicholas, but that is a bit of a there's a bit of a slam on philosophers in that 
section as well. But. Oh, <laughs> that's true. But if anyone keeps asking the questions, it's us. Yes. I, I, Unless we go on strike. I can't dispute that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. The great philosopher's strike of uh, yeah, 2014. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Find, finally, the people had had enough and <laughs> gave the philosophers all they asked for. <laughs> yeah. When do we matter to them even that much? <laughs> if athletes went on strike, it's a big deal, but not philosophers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That tells you everything you need to know. <laughs> Well, when we have a baseball strike here, it's, 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 which we have every, about every 10, 15 years, there's, there's, it's, life stops. We don't know what to do with ourselves. Yeah, those balls aren't being battered. Life can't go on. Uh, so, so the question is, why don't we have any baseball players on this panel then? Because <laughs> I strike. Well, because I'm very bad at baseball and I, I, I resent them. <laughs> oh, it all comes out. <laughs> <laughs> the truth will out. Great Google. Oh, sp- oh yeah. And here, here's the thing. What about the place of God in the Adam tradition? Well, That's the, ba- the Babelfish uh, proves his existence, right? So, <laughs> and so disproves it, That's and it. therefore disproves it. And he vanished from no, no. logic, and that was the last we heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it's like it, it, you mentioned that uh, you can use the uh, Adam's text as in a biblical fashion that you can go to it for any sort of information on any subject and that's what it's it's what clicked in that in my mind because in any in any uh dogmatic religious perspective god doesn't really fit into the adam's tradition like that's one of the things about the about adams about the adam's narrative is that is it all things are equal no no one thing stands out as the as the ultimate everything in a way is an ultimate. Well, there is the final message of God to his creation. I think uh, <laughs> that that kind of illustrates that uh, how God works in the Hitchhiker's Guide universe in that he's uh, more of just lost, like lost control of everything. Like he's not an all powerful being. He's uh-huh. just, or he may have insisted himself as one, but slowly realized that with the insanity of the universe that he's not. Well, there are two volumes of his well, greatest mistakes, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which yeah. no, I, I am disappointed so, nobody's ever sat down and, and written those volumes. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't put it past Dawkins. <laughs> he might do that, yeah. He was a great, friend. Sorry, dead he was a great friend of, uh, of Adam's, yeah. Yeah, that's true, yeah. God well, does appear in the Hitchhiker sometimes as a as a something like a bumbler uh, in the Babelfish episode. That's that's how he appears, and then as um, a kind of rueful regretter in the in God's final message to his creation, which turns out to be, uh, "We apologise for the inconvenience." Written in fifty foot high letters of fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. The Hitchhiker's Guide it, definitely the first thing people think of with Douglas Adams, but you can't forget the. The Dirk Gently books in which, uh, you know, Thor and Odin are, right, right. you know, they are gods and they're real. Uh, and sort of the punchline of the book is that, uh, uh, you know, you and your housekeeper avoiding the refrigerator long enough, you can in fact create another god of, of, you know, of nasty avoided refrigerator and <laughs> you know, interpersonal stress. So, you know, the, and there the idea was that, you know, that, that the gods were essentially created by people and that they could live and die. Uh, which is, uh, you know, I think, a, an interesting perspective on, and, and sort of speaks to a bit to Douglas Adams' view that you know that that the, that the gods are created by people, and you know, once they don't need them anymore, then then we treat them as mythology and not really relevant. Oh yeah, marvelous! I'd rather have forgotten that stuff. Yeah. 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 I'm not sure if that was uh, an influence on Neil Gaiman for American Gods. For American Gods, I was just yeah. Thinking. There's something similar in Pratchett as well. I mean, in his book, not, Small it's Gods. Not a, it's not a, mm-hmm. I, I, I think that, I don't know that that's an, an original idea. I think that that's sort of a uh, consensual reality idea, common consciousness type thing. 
where where uh, we just understand that as, as gods fall into disuse that they cease to exist. Yeah, right. and uh, of course Thor could walk down the street, giant man dressed in medieval clothing, and no one would pay any attention to him. They just averted their eyes. <laughs> and uh, oh, yeah. how, do, how do we interpret that? Well, I, I've interpreted a couple of different ways. One is that when people see things that don't fit into their world, they kind of make it fit into their world some somehow right. by somebody, somebody, somebody else's problem. problem fails. Yeah, the SCP. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, and the other thing is that you know Thor uh, is you know he's uh, he's dead to he, he's a, he's out of mythology that's dead to the, our culture and our our way of thinking now. So he's, right, yeah, uh, they they just. He, it's almost as if he was invisible. Yeah. Yeah. And Excellent. of course, we made the gods in our image, uh, to put it that way. So, you know, he fits in. Oh, yeah. But he, yeah. But as if he's wearing full, full clothing, he no longer fits in. You know, but there are people who can see him. And, and, and if, he, if he interacts with you, you'll notice him. But other than that, he's just not there. It, of course, then there's a, there's a somewhat godlike character. I believe it's in, uh, oh, it's in the third book that they go and visit and he's not really God in the sense of omniscient or omnipresent, but he seems to be in charge of things and he doesn't really seem to know what's going on. <laughs> this is wonderful. He's a philosophical skeptic, in fact. Yes. And he's, he, this is, and there's some suggestion that, um, uh, the fact that he, um, doubts everything, even to the extent of, um, not being sure that people are talking to him when they are talking to him, um, might, qualify him for us rather than disqualifying him <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah and which is connected to something that uh, connects to the idea or, or the lines that um, anyone who wants power shouldn't be allowed to have it <laughs> something else that, that Adam says yeah <laughs> another thing that sticks with me is the total perspective vortex and that, uh, Nicholas this was in your presentation three philosophical jokes from Hitchhiker I think yes we don't have a, a total perspective. We don't even have a very broad perspective. It, and, and we're, it, and I think his his um, his notion was that if we did, it would be terrifying. It hits me uh, and reminds me that <laughs> I don't have a very a very much perspective. Uh, how is that a philosophical joke, though? I mean, is that well? It's. It's philosophical, first of all, in a way that isn't very funny. Um, in that it's gives us to think that we could do with a bit more perspective often, as you've suggested. Uh, and it gets funnier when it suggests what happens if you have, um, in the immortal words of Spinal Tap, too much perspective. Namely, your brain gets annihilated. The creator of the title Perspective Vortex um, created it in order to show his wife that um, having his mind on higher things... Well, what was it? Um, his wife used to tell him that he should get some perspective because he spent too much time thinking. <laughs> and he built the vortex to show her that the one thing that intelligent beings cannot afford to have is perspective beyond a certain amount. <laughs> <laughs> and he plugs her into the machine, and what it does is um, show you the entire infinity of creation and a tiny marker within a tiny marker um, on this representation. And the tiny marker says, you are here. And he plugs his wife into this, and it annihilates her brain. And the, the philosophical point of that, I suppose, is that... According to, from the point of view of the universe, as it's sometimes put in philosophy, nothing that we do matters. And um, Adams seems to infer from that, judging by other things that he says in his fiction, that human life is absurd, although he doesn't seem to think that we should be particularly troubled by that absurdity. One interesting thing, though, is that it's not clear that it follows from... It's not clear that the idea that we're insignificant from the point of, the uni- point of view of the universe is really coherent, because presumably the universe doesn't actually have a point of view. Yes. But that might actually make the problem worse, because <laughs> now, rather than saying, um, from the point of view of the universe, we don't matter, we're saying... Um, uh, from the point of view of the universe, nothing matters, nor doesn't matter, because the universe doesn't have a point of view. And that can seem to make our mattering even more significant. Yes. It's like Sardi Bartfast said, I think it was, hang the sense of it and keep yourselves occupied. <laughs> yeah. 
Look at me. I design coastlines. Yes, indeed. Well, um, this is perhaps a serious solution to the problem of the meaning of life, and uh, maybe not so far from what um, from something Mike was suggesting earlier. Um, and we can put it this way. It may be that, from a cosmic perspective, life has no meaning, but that doesn't mean that we can't find a terrestrial meaning. And it doesn't mean that that meaning is not good enough. Why isn't it? Especially if the universe doesn't have a point of view, why should we contrast the meaning we find unfavorably with some sort of cosmic meaning? Well, then, are, are we the ones that give the universe a point of view, then? Uh, the penny drop. I don't know. I'm not, it's hard to know exactly what that would mean, to say that. Well, <laughs> <laughs> to be irritating. Well, I'm not asking for philosophy so much as speculation. Uh, <laughs> We can have ideas about what gives the universe a point. That's that's true. Um, but on the other hand, I'd say that most of those ideas are false. Or I'd say all of those ideas are false because the universe doesn't have a point of view. Or, or you know, whichever you know, whatever gets you through the night. You know, whatever's working for you. I go. I would. What you encapsulation of what you said just just immediately previous mm-hmm. that that uh, it doesn't it doesn't have a specific advantage or 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 reason for being and what meaning we take out of it is what meaning there is, which is a pretty good mechanism. Whatever. If we can, if, if you can look at something and, and get something from it, whatever you need or want, that's, that's, uh, you know, that's like, uh, the, the food generator in Star Trek. But does it make you like the Adams character, Colin, the happy robot? You know him? He's, he's happy because Ford has rewired his head. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of people on the planet that are having their head rewired, and uh, and uh, and it, it, you know, if it works for a person, that's the key. Okay, but what counts as working? Just making them happy? We could perhaps be happy if we had lobotomies. I don't, I don't know. I think there's some people that are happy being unhappy. I don't fight with them. Hmm. If I'm looking at reviews online about a restaurant, you can have nine reviews. <laughs> of, or, the people are just loving it, and there's inevitably one who's just well, like... <laughs> well, that's the point. Um, if, if someone is um, makes themselves happy by being um, thoroughly unpleasant, then it's not sure we should think it's a good thing. And thus, we have to qualify the ethic of whatever gets you through the day or night. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I, ce- I celebrate that. That's the whole thing. It's like, oh, you, you get, you're, you're the... It's, it's like a role. You're the... What's Spoil the, sport. The, yes! The spoiled part. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what would life be yeah. without the spoiled part? The stick in the mud, the, the uh, rain, the Mr. Rain on, on the parade. To put it politely, yeah. Oh, God, that's right. Put it politely is right. <laughs> well, devil's advocates and stick in the mud is a sort of modern, is a, a, a one thing. Um, but people who are thoroughly, seriously unpleasant is, is something else. Vlad the Impaler. Well, I mean, if. Yeah, that got into the day. We always qualify whatever gets you the night by saying whatever gets you the night as long as nobody else gets hurt and as long as it's all consenting adults and so on and so forth. We never say just whatever gets you to the night because yeah, okay. <laughs> but that's but see but that's that's Nicholas' point right there. Like it is whatever gets you through the night because even though we say that as you know supposedly sane people, there are the people that don't have that qualification as long as it doesn't hurt anyone. You know whatever gets you through the night and. I just happen to be a, a sociopathic killer. You, you okay, know but that, it, it, well, it's, we can distinguish two questions. One is, uh, what maxim do people actually live by or ethic? And maybe even the sociopaths go by something like whatever gets you through the night. And the other question is, what maxim or ethic should we live by? And we're presumably not going to endorse Vlad the Impaler methods. Exactly. That's like, in the, in the, in the US, there's a popular TV show. It's, it's a Dexter and they, and this guy goes around and he, and he brutally kills people that, apparently merit being brutally killed and and i think the series is over and uh, i think he he went into a whole nother line of work at the end of it and it's it's just like whatever is working for him as a character it, it was the point of the story that and the one part he was this this uh this morally vacuumous figure uh, ethos because he only is as doing bad things to bad people and then on a and that as he moves into his another another life stream or set part of his life, then another portion of his life stream, then he goes into a whole other field of enterprise that doesn't have that doesn't really relate to the first. And and it's just that it that's what is working for him at that time. Now for 
for, you know, I work when I, like I, I, I work with kids. So I work to encourage kids to, to be, to do good and do well and be good. But at the same time, I would be dishonest if I say, you know, if you're bad, uh, you shouldn't be bad. I have to say, if you're be, if you're bad, be as bad as you can be. Be, be the, just, uh, just be the epitome of bad. Like live, live it up. Go work go at big Goldman go Sachs. Home. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> if, if we are taking sort of societal uh, lessons from Douglas Adams, then we have to remember that uh, trying to re- rebuild your society uh, in your, you know, with only the people that you think are useful or good, then uh, you end up dying when you've gotten rid of all of the payphone cleaners, die of a payphone transmitted disease. And so, uh, you know. Oh, yes, that's political. I haven't quite realized that. It's, it, yeah, it makes one think of Stalin, for instance. Yeah. I always, I always thought that the, the joke about the telephone sanitizers was kind of tacked on, but uh, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, no, I'm not sure that Douglas Adams you know, ever tacked on to, anything. They, they split possibly the society not. Up into three groups, and, and they got rid of the, the one third they thought was useless. And it turns out that, uh, that you know, the societies end up having people being in society is whore, but it turns out that maybe they are useful. Like, you know, just like, which is, you know, it's. Mm-hmm happened quite a bit in, in real society as well with with people like um uh alan uh turing where society thought oh well he's he's you know this weird this gay man uh you know and they ended up chemically castrating him and he ended up committing suicide and it turns out that he was you know one of the most useful people in society at the time and that you know had had they not essentially screwed him up that uh i'm sure that the rest of his life he would have continued being fantastically productive and, and furthering really society and technology and, and everything. Yeah. Well, I, I would, but I have to admit, I, I kind of do li- live by the, the B arc metaphor quite a bit. Okay. I'm probably not an A arc, but I don't certainly don't want to be a B arc. <laughs> <laughs> well, that means you have to do some work. You have to be in the C arc. Yeah. And well, I, that's what I, that's what I'm, I'm a sea archer, I think. But, uh. Yeah. But that, that was, uh, that was, uh, I was, when you guys were talking about this, I was talking, uh, getting rid of the people in society that we, you know, that aren't, that aren't good. Well, who was, who was in the B arc? The marketing people and the, uh, <laughs> the advertising executives and the smooth right. jazz musicians. Uh, <laughs> The hairdressers, <laughs> hairdressers, yeah, hairdressers. But, but they're really. I didn't think there was a a arc or a c arc. I thought they like, no, they really weren't. But uh, they just used the b arc to get rid of them. Yeah, the a and c people were left on the planet. I always thought that was a, a great idea. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, I mean, and, and you know, for listeners, you know, for someone who's not familiar with the with the with the narrative, the you know, they 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 come across. And they, the people in the space arc communicate to them that, that there's three arcs that have left the planet and that they are the B arc and that they are made up of all these, all the, the marketing people and the advertising people and the hair, like the, the annoying people on the planet. And, uh, some, uh, apparently the A and C group had gotten together and communicated to the B group that, uh, we're sending you first because you're the most important. And uh, mm-hmm. the the B group bought into it and and took off and then uh, presumably that A and C live happily ever after. But you know, as we're pointing out right here, maybe we needed that B group. Maybe they had the key to some, and at the same time, maybe they didn't. And we're descended from the uh, B group. It turns out they inhabit the Earthlings um, owe to these telephone sanitizers and and hairdressers. And this is one of the ways in which the Earth as a program built to compute the ultimate question, i.e. to make sense of the idea that the answers of life, the universe and everything is 42. One of the reasons that program's gone wrong, there are multiple reasons, is that we're all defended, descended from these telephone sanitizers rather than the uh, apes we were meant to be, which is one of the many ways that um, Adam suggests that our life is absurd. I think the bit about, you know, them all dying from a telephone sanitized so, the, the unsanitary telephones after that is kind of just a little reminder of un, unintended consequences are <laughs> always going to bite us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, every time yeah. you, th- you think you can just do so- something simple and obvious to help society, it's probably you should rethink. <laughs> here in here in Key West, we have iguanas that, that, and 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 giant pythons. I, I mean, eighteen feet long. Not in Key West, but above us, 
that started out as pets that they sold in malls. And people just, they just grew so big they, that people unloaded them into the wilderness. And now they are taking over everything and eating all the other animals. That one's fairly foreseeable though, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, if you, if you take your python or your alligator, you buy it when it's small and you don't think it's going to get large. And then when it starts to get large, you flush it down the loo. Or... <laughs> right. <laughs> so that really happened here. And they, they are, uh, unbelievable. But that's the sort of thing oh. that we as human beings do. We make these, these, uh, Pur- purportedly logical choices and decisions, these methodical plans that that go hilariously awry. And, yeah, if you, I mean, getting the joke really is what is it is is at, at the crux of all of what Adams is working to communicate. Get the joke, and 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 a lot of times the joke is not just on you, but you are the joke. I, it was me the whole time. There, there was someone, I'm not sure um, who it is, it's someone in the, um, there's a collection called uh, The Anthology at the End of the Universe, in which science fiction writers write about Adams, and um, someone in there um, says that Adams was an equal opportunity mocker, and then there's, there's a list, I think, of all the different types of people that Adams has mocked, and it's quite a long list. And I felt better reading that, because to start with, I thought it was just the philosophers, with uh, room, the characters of Room Fondle and uh, Magithai's. But it's not just us, it's everyone. Telephone sanitizers, advertising executives, computer I, programmers. I think that in the, in the course of this conversation, we came up with a, a, a very uh, Adamsian gimmick uh, mechanism or, or idea, and that is the uh, the philosopher strike, which is absolutely <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> you won't say and that when it happens. Uh, and then, and then that would make that, in, in, you know, going back to what I just said, that Nicholas, Today you are the joke. <laughs> I'm okay with that. <laughs> a philosopher strike on the planet. <laughs> All the philosophers went on strike on, and nothing happened. <laughs> it's like, uh, what if someone gave a war and no one came? <laughs> I think you'll find there'll be an unintended consequence. <laughs> <Honestly>. <laughs> we we'll all perish from insufficient thought. Too yeah. little perspective. <laughs> now this is starting to warm up. Ben, I don't think we've heard from much from you yet about uh, if, there's, if there's something we haven't covered that, that you'd like to get into. Well, uh, I was actually going to make a comment earlier when we were talking about, uh, you know, what matters uh, with sort of a, a sideways angle on it in that uh, since Douglas Adams was here, we've actually found out that most of the universe is, in fact, not matter. So, which I'm sure he would have been pleased by to find out that, uh, the, you know, everything we are, everything we see, everything we've ever done is, is whatever it is. It's, it's 2% or 3% of the universe and the rest of it, we, we have no idea what it is, which I think is, is sort of one of those cosmic jokes. Like, you know, we, you know, you could spend your entire life just looking around and thinking, you know, how amazing this is and looking at all the stars and everything. And then through science, we figure out that in fact, that everything we can see is just some tiny, almost insignificant portion of this greater thing of, of, of all the dark matter and the dark energy and that uh, and that in fact we don't understand really anything and that we just give them these names so that we feel slightly better about not knowing what the hell they are there's a joke in Adams about that, that last bit isn't there there's some scientist I think um, who um, is uh, on the news trying to explain some phenomenon and uh, doesn't understand it and so uh, and actually yeah, he says yeah. this and then, then gives it some ridiculous name saying that this is what we do when we don't understand something make what to make people think we do uh, how about you jim ever soft spoken i sorry about that i accidentally had muted my microphone and i was talking and anyway <laughs> so yes actually so um the whole bit about the learning to fly and speaking with the birds and um that seems to be just to be a Really interesting allegory for, you know, I, I guess it's simultaneously accomplishing the impossible and falling flat on your face. Uh, I, he writes <laughs> a very interesting line there <laughs> with that. So, so that was definitely something that struck me when I was uh, doing my little uh, read through, reread through of the books here uh, over the last month. So, it's interesting. yeah, it's it's. You know, a, a 
thinly veiled little bit about uh, both the hubris and the ridiculousness of how humans look at the world. What about the scene in uh, very early in the first Hitchhiker book where they go to the pub and he tells the barman that the world's about to end and he's or should I put a bag over my head or something like that? And <laughs> yes, <laughs> it makes you feel yes. better. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> but it won't yeah. make any difference. <laughs> All right, then, well. <laughs> All right, everybody, you know, get your last drinks order in. <laughs> last call, folks. That, that's like trying to purposely diminishing perspective. It's like the um, the Ogleroons, who are the, the characters that are served to introduce the, the Vortex joke. They um, <laughs> they have a whole planet, but they just live in one rather overcrowded nut. <laughs> all of them together <laughs> or the uh horrible miscalculation of scale where the whole herbally weapon battle fleet arrives and is eaten by a small dog okay. <laughs> yeah <laughs> another another perspective problem yeah <laughs> or the fo- the folks that uh decide that uh, i think it's the third book they come out of their planet for the first time and see the entire universe in all its splendor and say it's wonderful. It's magnificent. It has to go. It's too much. Yeah, that, right. That's a, a perspective to a, a reaction to discovering, um, to getting some perspective. Yeah, it can not only annihilate your brain; it could also make you want to kill everybody. But I, I, I can't help but think there's quite a few humans who pretty much have the same uh, feeling about science and yes. our discovery of the universe. That oh, it's too much. It has to go. We we're much happier with uh with dogma. Mm. Let's face it. I mean, we're, we're not the the notion of doubting everything is. I think a correct me if I'm wrong. That's a that's kind of a, a Western cultural invention going back maybe a couple thousand years, but not. It's not something that goes deep into prehistory. It would be interesting to know. I, yeah, I don't know. It's okay to doubt whether your neighbor's goat uh, ate, ate your plants, but not 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 uh, not everything you've been raised on since you were a child. You don't. You just don't. Yes, it's going to be a view that um, when it arose would often have been suppressed if yes if it took on any and thought often, because it's often. obviously um, a critical view. <laughs> yeah. So th- th- these folks decided to destroy the entire universe because it, <laughs> it didn't <laughs> it created way too much doubt. Does anybody have any uh, final things they'd like to mention? It's okay to doubt and and be skeptical of of what we have been raised on and what we've learned and the the uh, the dogmas or or the ideas that that we've taken for granted as long as you have something to replace it like the uh the and the the indian indian indiana, indiana jones where he's going for the goblet and he switches it with the sand you, you know you have to if you don't if you don't you're going if you don't have something to replacement you you will find yourself in a void and it seems that Adams, the what he fills it with is humor. That's that's the whole. It's his the whole thing is his whole universe is just filled with with yucks. And mm-hmm. for for me, that's what I take away mm-hmm. from it. That's what I carry. Mm-hmm. That's that's what. what mm-hmm. I, I think that's suggested by um, one of the contributors to my book, Amy Kind. Um, she recounts how uh, the philosopher Camus thought that we should respond to the absurdity of the universe by being defiant, by giving it a V sign. Um, uh, whereas Adams, uh, she suggests, uh, thinks we should laugh at it. <laughs> Maybe some of both. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, laughing at laughing at things is, is can be a form of defiance. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, George Clinton, the funk master, you know, Parliament Funkadelic, had an album that says some of my some of my best jokes are friends. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just wanted to make a, a reading recommendation, and that is uh, P.G. Woodhouse. Uh, he was actually one of the biggest influences on Douglas Adams that not many people are familiar with. And he was writing, you know, around the, the turn of the century, you know, in the early 1900s. Um, and he... Uh, he actually invented the, the idea of the long dark tea time of the soul. It's that, that's actually a reference to one of his books. And I don't know if it was intentional or if it, or not, but you can actually find that in one of his books before, you know, well before Douglas Adams. Right. But, uh, the, the sort of style of everything being connected together and it all working out in the end is sort of the, you know, is, is the, 
the standard of, of P.G. Woodhouse. And if you read through some of his books, uh, you definitely can see some of the influence on Douglas Adams and his stuff. But uh, at the same time, they're all about essentially, you know, the lives of rich people on the English countryside, though for some people it won't really work out. But uh, <laughs> but I really enjoyed reading them. And, you know, every once in a while you just get a, a glimpse of insight into sort of the mind of Douglas Adams and, and what uh, what his ideas were based on. So uh, you have any, I just uh, wanted to recommend that to people. As to, to what book to start with for from him? Uh, that's a bigger challenge because he wrote, he was one of those very prolific writers. I, I would probably start uh, the uh, Jeeves and Worcester books were sort of his best well known, but I would start with one of the, the Smith books uh, spelled P S M I T H. The P is silent. Yeah. I've, I've read, I've read a couple of those. Yeah. 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 So I, I would start with one of those. I, they're, they're all quite enjoyable and I can't actually remember which book it is that has the long dark tea time of the soul reference in it. But, well, we're gonna, uh, to, we're gonna have to find uh, out. If anybody finds that again, let me yeah, know. Yeah, let me know. I'd like to hear. Yeah. That. I haven't read the um, the Smith books, but I have read uh, some of the non Jeeves and Worcester ones, and I was disappointed by them. Um, uh, I horrified really because I loved the Jeeves and Worcester ones. Um, they absolutely delighted me, but the non Jeeves and Worcester ones seemed um, not at all good to me, unfortunately. But I'll try the Smith ones. Well, yeah, I think I, I've read a f- few of, bo- of both, and the, the, I. They do. They fly by. You, you'll read them quickly. Uh, something about humorous books. They they seem to be over too soon. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I, I think Woodhouse is a wonderful antidote to all those very serious books, psychological novels about rich people. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, in Woodhouse, you just have rich people being very jolly and uh, saying "What ho, trotters all" and that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and aunts of, of different varieties, formidable aunts and uh, nurturing aunts. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I'd like to thank everybody. Uh, Nicholas Joel, uh, Mike Mongo, Jim Cavera, Ben Brocker, Jeremy Hunsberger. Thanks. It's been great. I, I have a question. Yeah, thank you. Oh, oh, on the way out. Uh, Nicholas, is your book available on Amazon? Is it, you're up. it is, but you shouldn't buy it from them because they mistreat their workers. Okay. So uh, what's, the, what's the name of your book? It's called Philosophy and the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and it's published by Palgrave. And so where should we buy it? You could, you could try Google Play. Google's not as bad. Or, yeah, Bookshop. Okay, okay great. Thank or you. Amazon if you absolutely have to. I still get some of the money. <laughs> great. Okay. Well, thanks. Well, thanks, Thank everybody. Uh, yep. I'll, this, this is going to come out on Towel Day, uh, May 25th. So I'll... Excellent. Good Thank you. Here. Goodbye. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. My thanks to Ape Descendants, Nicholas Joel, Jeremy Hunsberger, Ben Brockert, Jim Cavera, and Mike Mongo for participating on the panel. You will, of course, want to check out Nicholas Joel's book, Philosophy and the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, available in fine bookstores all over the sub-Ethernet. All manner of linkage is to be found in the show notes at wowsignalpodcast.com. And now, I thought it would be fun to close with a hitchhiker-based song by Eben Brooks, Take Me Apart. This is the Wow Signal. Uh, the lyrics, mostly written by Douglas Adams, I had to add a verse to fill it out. <laughs> this wow. is a public service announcement about why you should not use teleportation. It is dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> Beetlejuice's pretty girls will knock you off your feet. They'll do anything you like them to, real fast or real slow. But if you have to take me apart to get me there, I don't want to go. Sing and take me apart, take me apart. What a way to roam. And if you have to take me apart to get me there, I'll stay right here at home. Is paved with gold, or so it is said. By not to then go on to say, See, tell before you're dead. I'll gladly take the high road, or even take the low, but if you have to take me apart to get me 